start today's uh, sermon series called They Call Him Holy Spirit. I want to start this morning looking at John, the 14th chapter, verses number 15 through 21 in the NIV translation. And it says this, this is Jesus speaking. He said, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you how long? How long? Forever. Verse number 17, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now, there's a lot in that. There's a whole lot in that, I in them, thou in me, you in us, you know, and at one time I'd done the, I had done those, taken those dolls, I can't remember what they're called, but those little dolls, you know, they look like little china dolls and you can stack them inside of one another. That's the illustration that Jesus is giving you here, like those little dolls, where you take, there's one doll and then there's a doll inside the doll and then there's a doll inside the doll. You're the doll inside the doll inside the doll. Isn't that a blessing? God is on the outside. Jesus is in him and we are in him. And so thank God for that. But he said, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. You know, more than 30 years ago, I entered into a relationship with someone who wasn't good for me. At that time, I was uh, formally seeing Pastor Skip, and because of the relationship with the other individual, I made the decision to break things off with Pastor Skip. He wasn't Pastor Skip, he was just Skip then. One day, after I made this decision, a voice spoke to me and lovingly helped me see the heart of the individual that I had chosen to be with over Skip. And by doing a very simple compare and contrast, he opened my eyes and helped me see that Skip really was the better choice for me. And I'll never forget his words. He said, now this, is, this was the voice talking to me. Now this individual is pressuring you to compromise your relationship with the word of God. He wants you to have physical relationships with him outside of marriage. Did you notice Skip never pressured you that way? He went on to ask me, did you notice that you're able to go and come as you please with Skip, but with this man, you can't even go to the grocery store without first asking him? Did you notice that he can quote Bible scriptures and knows all of the Christian jargon, but his life doesn't match his words? But did you also notice that Skip isn't as versed in the scriptures, but his life models that of Jesus Christ? Now, although this was an emotional decision for me to make, had this voice, this person not said these things to me, I would have made the worst mistake of my life and married the wrong person. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. In 1991, while I was in Bible college in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I worked third shift as a night hotel auditor. And one night I was headed to work driving down what's called 61st Street. And 61st Street is a dark two-lane road that led out of Tulsa into this small little suburb known as Broken Arrow, which is where my job was. On this particular night, it was hot and it was muggy and my windows were down and as my windows were down, I was driving and you could hear the crickets chirping and you could hear the wind blowing through the car. But suddenly while I was driving the car, I heard a very stern, subtle voice say, stop the car. Now I was the only one, the only physical being in the car, but I heard the voice very loud, very strong and very clear, stop the car. 
I immediately slammed the brakes and the moment that I did, a train came zooming by my car. And I remember sitting at those train tracks holding the wheel with tears rolling down my eyes as my car was vibrating from that train and me being so close to the train. Now for almost two years, I had been driving down this road and had had to stop by, you know, this area for the train tracks on a few occasions. But this time there was no pre-train warning signs, no flashing lights from the train tracks. You couldn't even hear the sound of the train. All I heard in the car was stop the car. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Now, these are just a few subtle examples of how the person known as the Holy Spirit has worked in my life. And time won't allow me to share with you all all the times that he's assisted me with my children, in my marriage, in my relationships, and in this church. He's always been present and has proven himself to be a faithful confidant, a faithful friend, and a faithful support in my life. My grandmother called him her first mind. The world calls him the conscience or their intuition. But who is this person we call the Holy Spirit? And is he really real? And what purpose does he serve in our everyday life? For the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do my best to introduce to some and recall to memory to others the truth about the one who works in perfect harmony with God the Father and his son Jesus Christ, the person known as the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, I thank you for the truth of the Word of God. I thank you that as we come to you and as we're coming to the Word to learn, that your Spirit is working with us. It's your desire that we grow. Jesus said that you wanted us to know you, and it's our desire to know you, but we know that we can only know you through one person, and that's the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that he knows your heart. He knows your character. He knows your personality. And so, Father, it's through him that we will come to know you. We understand that we came into relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. But that was even a working of the Holy Spirit. And so today we thank you that you have positioned us. And Father, as I've been listening, as I've been listening, I know that this message is not just a message that you're giving to me. But I thank you that throughout the body of Christ, by and large, you're bringing the church into a, an awareness again of the Holy Spirit. And I know, Father, in my heart that the reason that you're doing this is because this is the season. This is the time. This is the moment. This is the moed for signs, wonders, and miracles. And so, Father, in order for us to walk in signs, wonders, and miracles, we've got to know the miracle worker. We've got to become acquainted with your spirit, yielding to him. And so today, come on, you all, lift your hands. Come on, come on. Today, we lift our hearts to you. Father, it's to you that we lift our hearts. But there is a yieldedness to the one that you've called to walk with us. Holy Spirit, in this place today, we acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge your presence. And Father, as we're learning, even when we're in our house, I see some of you walking in your houses, saying, I give place to you, Holy Spirit. And like Benny Hinn said, good morning, Holy Spirit. So Father, we thank you that we will give place to him. We'll remember that he's with us. And we give you glory and honor for what you will teach us today. You are the teacher. You're the best teacher I know. You're the best teacher I know. And so today, we're looking to you to open up our eyes. Give us wisdom and revelation in who you are. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. There's many ideologies and philosophies surrounding the Holy Spirit in the world. But it's really important that we embrace what the Bible has to say about him. 
If what we know is merely based on what someone told us and not what's written in scripture, then we're going to run the risk of believing things about him that are not true, good things and bad things. God always wants us to know the truth because if you receive a lie, you're going to believe a lie. And if you believe a lie, you will live your life from a place of deception. And you'll see things through the lens of deception, thinking that you know the truth when in actuality, you don't. And that can cost you greatly. We need to see the truth about the Holy Spirit and his role in our life so that we can meet, so that we can reap the benefits of walking with him. You see, it's one thing to take in a lot of religious information that really doesn't benefit you in your practical life. And we've said it before, if what you know, if what you receive doesn't translate into something that you can live out in your everyday life, it's useless. It's garbage. If you're listening to sermons, hear me out. If you're listening to sermons and, and, and all you're getting is a good feeling, but it does not translate into transformation in your life, it's garbage. Amen. What we want is wisdom, revelation, and knowledge from God's word that will transform the way that we think so that the way we think can transform the way that we live. Amen. Amen. So it's one thing to think religiously, but it's an entirely different thing to realize that God would never give you or I something or someone for no reason at all. If the Holy Spirit has been given to us by God, then it has to be for a specific purpose. And it's important for us to know that purpose and then to live our life based upon that purpose. Amen? Amen. We have to be careful. Because in life, when we don't know what something is or what something is for, we will misuse it or we'll abuse it. And it was Miles Monroe who coined the phrase, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. In other words, when you don't know why something exists, then you will abuse it because it's not being utilized or consumed in the way that it was designed or in the way that it was created. It's kind of like your gallbladder. Medical research and doctors have said that you don't need your gallbladder because, you know, no, people are living their life and they seem to be living a productive life without their gallbladder. But God would never have given you a gallbladder if you didn't need one. I know people, you doctors that are out there saying, no, 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 they don't need it. But God gave us that gallbladder. And if God gave us the gallbladder, there is a reason for it. And just because a man or a woman may stand and say there is no re reason for it or negate the, the use of it, it does not negate the fact that God gave it to us and there is a purpose for it because God doesn't waste. Amen. Amen. Everything God does serves a purpose. So the, sa excuse me, the same holds true for the Holy Spirit. God gave him to us for a reason. And if we don't understand why, then we're going to run the risk of living our life without his assistance in areas and places that we really need him the most. You need the Holy Spirit in your practical, everyday life. He's not just with us so that we can have great church services. He will show up in our services, but he's not here for that reason alone. His primary purpose for being in the earth today is to help you know who God is so that you can live the kind of life that God has designed for you to live. Isn't that a blessing? Now, I'm going to take my time and go through this. I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to scream. Because I feel like it's important when we're getting to know one another. If I were getting, when I was getting to know Pastor Skip, you know, and he would take me out to eat, I wasn't screaming at him. He wasn't screaming at me trying to get to know him. What we were doing was breaking things down, talking sweetly to one another, talking slowly to one another, hanging on every word because we wanted to understand how the other person thought. We wanted to understand how the other person worked. And so today, as we're going through the scriptures and as we're looking at the person of the Holy Spirit, don't, don't rush me. Don't rush me. Don't let your spirit rush me because in your rush, you'll miss something that God has for you. Amen? 
Look at the person next to you and say, don't, don't rush. Look at the other person and say, don't rush. Don't rush me. All right, now, last week, Pastor Skip made the statement. He said, you've got to know your inner strength. And then he went on to say that I'm not talking about your gifting, your knowledge, and all of those kinds of things. But he said, I'm talking about the inner strength who lives in you, meaning the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, that resonated with me because while he was talking, I started thinking about the fact that most people are not acquainted with who their inner strength is. They're not acquainted with him. They don't know him. And more importantly, they don't know what Jesus said about him. But let's go back and look at a few things that Jesus said. When we read in John, the 14th chapter, verse number 16, can you help me come down? I feel like I need to be on the floor. When we read in, in John, the 14th chapter, verse number 16, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be our helper. Now, that's an important word, and we can look at that word helper, but it's important to look the word helper up because the word helper is the Greek word paraclete or parakletos. And here is what that means. It means, so Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is your comforter. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. I mean, have you ever had to use a lawyer before? He was your advocate. The Holy Spirit is your comforter. How many of you have ever lost somebody? How many of you have ever felt sad and you needed somebody to comfort you? He's your comforter, your advocate, your intercessor. How many of you have ever been in a place where you wanted to go and have somebody speak for you? Again, an attorney. He is your counselor. How many of you have ever needed counsel? And then he says he's your strengthener and your standby. All of that is in who the person of the Holy Spirit is. And then another thing that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit is that he would live with us forever. Say forever. Meaning that he is a permanent resident in your life. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. That means that while you're living and when you transition from this life, he will still be with you. I looked up the word forever in the dictionary. And this is what it means. It means permanent, lasting, always. And those are good words, that the Holy Spirit will be with me permanently. The Holy Spirit will be with me lasting. The, per the Holy Spirit will be with me always. But then I went and I looked that up in the interlinear Greek because I wanted a deeper revelation of what that word forever means. And this is what it says in the interlinear Greek. It means, forever means an unbroken age, meaning there will never be any gaps in his, in his time in your life. So you will never leave, listen to me, so you will never live your life, there will never be a season in your life when the Holy Spirit will not be with you. You mean to tell me that even when I'm in my messiest of mess, the Holy Spirit will be with me when I'm in the messiest of my mess. Yes, the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. How do we know that he will be with us in our messiest of our mess? Because you can't get out of your mess if the Holy Spirit is not with you. He's the one that brings us out of our mess. And here's what the Bible says about him. Here's what David said about him. Where can I go from your presence? When you look up that word presence, when you really, really look up that word presence, it means face, the face. We thought it meant that it was just the Spirit of God hovering over us in the atmosphere. No, but the presence of God means the face of God. And so literally what we're saying, Lord, we want your presence is we're saying, Lord, I want your face. I want to be face to face with you. That's your position. That's your posture. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who's going to be with you how long? Thank you, Jesus. He's going to be with us forever. He goes on to say he's going to be with you throughout eternity. So you might as well, while you're on this side of eternity, get used to and get to know the Holy Spirit. Because you will close your eyes on this side and open your eyes on that side and he'll still be with you.
Then it goes on to say that he'll be with you throughout the world, plural, throughout the universe. The Bible says that the day is coming when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And so he's saying, I'm going to be with you in this one, this decayed world. And then when you make your transition to the next world, I'm going to be with you there. And then when God pulls you out of the next world, which is heaven, into the new world, he said he's going to make a new heaven. When you get to the new heaven, I'm going to be there with you. Everywhere you go for the rest of your life, for the rest of your existence, not just your natural life, for the rest of your existence, the Holy Spirit is going to be with you. Doesn't it make sense? Now, here's the thing. I've had four kids and I've got four grandkids. I've got a husband. Do you know that I know that Skip is not going to always be with me? The day is going to come when he's not going to be with me. I was raised by my grandmother, and the day came on December 15, 2015, that my grandmother left me. Huh? She left me. But do you know the Holy Spirit is never going to leave me? He's going to be with me forever and for always. So this is important to know because no matter where I go, no matter what I go through, even in my darkest of darkest of times, when I feel like I'm all by myself, when nobody cares about me, when nobody's checking on me, there is somebody with me in his name and we call him the Holy Spirit. It's understandable why Jesus said or why the word of God says over and over again in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, where God said it three times. I will not, I will not. I will not leave you. I will not, I will not, I will not forsake you. This is the amplified version. I will not, I will not, I will not abandon you. How many of you have ever felt abandoned? How many of you have ever felt alone? Even though you felt that way, I want you to know you weren't alone. You're trying to figure out how did I get out of that mess? The Holy Spirit got you out of that mess. How did things turn out so well for me in spite of all that I've been through? The Holy Spirit was working with you. Amen. And I want to say this. You know, when I was growing up in church, I was a kid and, you know, we came out of the Baptist church and then we went into the Pentecostal church. And, you know, when you would be in church and people would get excited, you know, they would get emotional. People would call their emotionalism, they got the Holy Ghost. And they would, you know, it, it may have been a situation where the Holy Spirit did manifest himself on someone's life, but that wasn't the Holy Ghost. That was their emotional response to the Holy Ghost. And so we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is not an emotion. He's not an emotion. He's the third person of the Godhead or what the Christ or what we Christians call the Trinity. Trinity's not in the Bible. But he's the third person of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one other thing, he's not an it. He's not an inanimate object. And when people talk about the Holy Spirit, you know, we had somebody on our board one time, you know, they would say, my Holy Spirit tells me, you know, and they would talk about him, talk about him in an inanimate way. But your Holy Spirit is my Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit is Jesus' Holy Spirit. And he's not an it, he's a person. And he's a person to be worked with, listened to, talked to. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I used this illustration with the first service, and I was telling the first service, you know, if I were to pull Aji in, you know, anytime you start talking about somebody, you want to talk about that person accurately. And if you know somebody's having something to say, there's an opportunity for that person to misrepresent who I am. And because I want to make sure that you say the right thing about me, that you're speaking truth about me, and that you're telling people, you're giving, you're projecting who I am to people in a truthful way, I'm going to make sure that when you're telling people about me, I'm going to show up. I'm going to come in the room. I'm not going to leave you to talk about me. 
to you. I'm going to come in the room so I can tell you what to say about me. And so as we're talking about the Spirit of God, you can have an expectation that he is going to manifest himself. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And so if you're in this room this morning and you have on a religious hat, you need to take it off. You need to take it off. Because what we're doing is we're moving into a space where the Holy Spirit can be himself. Where he can speak to us and manifest himself however he desires. How many of you can already sense him? Can you sense him right now? He's already in this room. He came in the room when you walked in the room. But here's the thing, you know, it's, it's sometimes when people can walk in a room and you know that they're in, oh yeah, Melva's in the room, but then there's times when Melva can show up in the room, right? When all eyes will turn around and pay attention to what Melva's got on and how Melva's strolling into the room. That's how it will be with the Spirit of God. You're going to have a greater consciousness of His presence, not just in this building, but in your house, in your car. How many of you are going to believe for that? So let's learn about who he is. It's, it's, it's so important for us to learn who he is. Because in learning who he is, then we get to benefit from who he is. And everything that Jesus and the Father said about him becomes ours. You can walk in the reality of it. The reason that you're not walking like you should walk is because you don't know him. You don't know him the way that you should. A lot of us have a lot of religious ideas and a lot of religious ways, and we do things the way that we do them because we've learned, we've become professional Christians. But I want you to know that there is a place. There is a place that you can walk with God where you're so sensitive to the Spirit of God. And like me driving down the road and the Spirit of God saying, stop the car. Because I was in relationship with him, he knew that he could tell me to stop the car. And I put my foot on the brakes and my car stops. But what if I had not listened to him? What if I had not cultivated? See, that didn't come in that moment when I was on my way to work. That was a lifestyle of cultivating time with the Spirit of God. Listen, listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. It was a lifestyle of cultivating every day, going to the Word of God, looking at the Word of God, allowing, because the Bible says that the Word and the Spirit agree. They're the same voice. And so when I'm looking at the Word of God and I'm listening to what the Word of God says, the Spirit of God is speaking to me through the Word of God. So I became accustomed to hearing His voice. Do y'all hear me? I became accustomed to hearing His voice. And as a result of me becoming accustomed to hearing His voice, when He said, stop your car, I stopped my car. And some of you, he's been talking to you and you didn't realize it was the Holy Ghost. My grandmother didn't realize. She didn't call it the Holy Ghost. She called it her first mind. She said, my first mind told me, don't do that. My first mind, my first mind told me, don't, don't do that. And some of you, you've been ignoring your first mind. You've been ignoring the voice of the Spirit of God. Because you're a believer, he's forever talking to you. But you can train yourself to become callous to his voice. I thought about this. I get amazed when people call the Holy Spirit an it but you never hear them address the devil like that. Every, it's clear, it's clear to everybody that Satan is personified. I've never heard anybody say, the devil, it made me do that. Never, never, never. It's always he. The devil is busy. The devil spoke to me. The devil said this. The devil had me thinking. The devil all. But then when it comes to the spirit of God, then we want to make him inanimate. That is a trick of the enemy. The enemy did that. 
The devil did that. Listen to me. Listen to me. The devil did that so that we could detach from him as a person and think that, he, that we're aloof just like he did with God. He made us think that we didn't have a right to approach God and that we're separate and that we're independent of God. He's a liar. The Holy Spirit is a person. Amen. So I want you to keep your heart open and your faith active while we go through these teachings because anyone who does is going to become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and he's going to become more real to you. See, he's already in you. He's, he, what's going to happen is your consciousness, your, the eyes of your spirit, your understanding are going to be enlightened. But he's not going to be any more real in you when I'm done than he is right now. You're going to become more aware. You're going to become more sensitive. But he is who he is in you, in his fullness right now. See, the Bible says that we go from one degree of glory to the next. That means that we're going to go from one degree of revelation about who he is to the next. Amen? Amen. Are y'all with me? So as a collective body, we're going to get to know him. And it's going to impact our individual lives in a transformative way. We're going to learn by paying attention to what God the Father and Jesus, his son, said about the Holy Spirit. And we're also going to learn, the Spirit of God just said to me, some of you, when you first gave your life to me, you knew me. Some of you, when you first gave your life to me, you knew me. And you had a sensitivity to me that you have lost because you've become distracted. And the Bible tells us, now this is me speaking, the Bible tells us that it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three things that pull us away from our first love. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But aren't you glad that it takes a decision, one decision, to get back into your place? Thank you, Father. And so this is, this, is, this, is, this is the groove right here, right here, right here. I'm not moving from this spot. I'm not trying to be dynamic. I'm not trying to be any of that. I'm trying to help you all to see. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you to see. And I'm fighting tears. I'm so glad that our 21 days of prayer and fasting are coming. I'm excited about this because it's going to give you prayer power. Knowing the role of the Holy Spirit in your life is going to empower you to consecrate yourself to God in a marvelous way. You see, to tr be a truly spiritual person, you submit to the Word of God and you tune your ears to the voice of His Spirit. That's a spiritual person. And so our 21 days of prayer and fasting is designed to position you to hear clearly the voice of God so that you will know what you're to do in the coming year. You will know what phase you're stepping in into your life, your ministry, your business. You'll know what to do about your finances. You'll know what to do about your relationships. You'll know what to do about your children. You'll know what to do about your health. Listen to me. See, it has to translate practically. It's not just this pie-in-the-sky gospel that we're trying to teach that you cannot take home and live it. See, the, the, the Word of God has to become something that you can take home and use to raise your children, use to balance your checkbook and to get out of debt. I'm going to say this. The Lord said to me, you tell the people, don't make any major decisions until this consecration is over. So for the next 21 days from August 4th to August 24th, we're going to be here every night praying and fasting. But I want you all to hear me. 
See, Kenneth Hagin said to the Lord, and then I'm going to close. I know i got to close. So Kenneth Hagin said to the Lord in prayer, Father, why is it that there's so much sickness and death in the body of Christ today? He said in the 50s and the 60s, we didn't see so much sickness and death in the body. And Brother Hagin said, the Lord said to him, yea, yes, but the consecration of my people was greater. It was greater. And so, yes, our desire is to help you all fulfill your dreams and get to your destiny and, and give you, empower you to live your best life but not neglecting your spirit and not neglecting the spiritual part of you because real prosperity is you having your spirit on point, your education on point, your finances on point, and your body on point. But many times we focus, and I've said this and I'll continue to say it, we focused on just two-thirds of who we are and we have neglected, sorely neglected our spirit. And then when things go down, we fall apart. We don't know what to do when God is saying, allow my spirit to govern your life. And so for the next 21 days, starting August 4th through the 24th, don't make any decisions. Just let God speak to you. Amen. So I'll close with this. The most important person on the earth is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is more important than the president. He's more important than kings. He's more important than any ruler of any nation. He has more wisdom than any professor in any university. He has more knowledge than all the books in any library. The Holy Spirit is the most important person on the planet, and here's why. He is the one that the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ sent to complete his work and purpose in the earth. He's the one Jesus sent to do the work of the Father. So it makes sense to say that the most important work on the earth is not your job. It's fulfilling the work that the Holy Spirit gives us to fulfill. And I'll say this, the Old Testament is seen primarily as the work of the Father. The New Testament Gospels is seen primarily as the ministry or the working of Jesus. We are living now in the days of the working of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. Listen to me. We are living in the days of the Holy Spirit. When you read in the Old Testament, the Old Testament talks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord lasted 33 years, and it was the ministry of Jesus. But then when you look in Joel chapter 2, verse number 28, Joel chapter 2, 28 says, In the last days, D-A-Y-S. The Old Testament talks about the day of the Lord. That was the span of the life of the ministry of Jesus. But then Joel prophesied that there is coming the days, the last days. And then Peter, when he stands up, he makes reference to what Joel says in the book of Acts. He said, I said in the last days, God said, he said, this is that. They were asking, what is this on the day that they poured out the Holy Spirit? And Peter said, this is that, spoken of the prophet Joel, that in the last days, listen to me, I am going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons your daughters are going to prophesy and have dreams and visions when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and on the day of Pentecost the last days began so we are living in what's known as the dispensation of the last days I want y'all to know we're there I want you to know we're there and I'm going to say this. I did not say this to the first group, but I'm going to say it. And Tim McMurtry can back up what I'm about to say. The nations are being set for the last and final battle. You got Turkey against now against America, forming an alliance with Russia. The Bible prophesied this. That Turkey, Iran, Asia, uh, 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 Korea... They were all going to form an alliance and stand against the nation of Israel. I want you all to know that that is happening as we speak. So we're not just living in the last days. We're living in the last day of the last days. And we used to hear it when we were coming up. 
Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Now in Israel, the Jews are saying, we know that you all are looking for his second coming. We're looking for his first coming. So you've got Jews and Gentiles. You've got Christians and Jews now all saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You're living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And just like Jesus walked the earth and 20,000 people would be in his meeting, they would all try to get to him, all try to get to him. He was walking and living the earth and pouring his life out. Now we are living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And all the blessings, all the... The church is ignorant. The church is ignorant. He said, these signs are, going to, signs are going to follow those that believe in my name. They're going to cast out devils. They're going to speak with new tongues. They're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. We're not functioning as we should be because we don't know him. In prayer, I said to the Lord, help me. Help me to say this without emotion. Help me to say this without extra. But then I said to the Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. And you're going to have to teach us again. You're going to have to teach us again. Because the world has distracted us from you. And we don't know what you look like anymore. We don't know what you look like anymore. We don't know your voice anymore. But we want to know. And if you'll speak to us, and he will, you speak to us again. We will position ourselves. And every day in our lives, we will obey what you say. Amen? Amen. Come on, Pastor Skip. Thank you.